The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a cornucopia fit to pop, filled with October mass market paperback goodness. Ethan Allen Furniture of the Mind. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We talk with David Drake this time about the new edition of his book, Patriots. Bain is reissuing Patriots as a young adult novel now at Booksellers, and Dave recounts how it came to be written and what period and personalities in history he used for inspiration because Dave likes to do that. That's coming up. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Looks like it's a Drake Palooza. Now here's the news. This month, three new paperbacks hit the booksellers. First is The Road to Hell by David Weber and Joel Presby. This is David Weber's excellent continuation of his multiverse series, where magic meets steampunk science. Dave has found a great collaborator in Joel Presby to continue a great series. Also out is Raising Cain by Charles E. Gannon. Chuck Gannon's critically acclaimed Cain Reardon series continues as Cain military intelligence officer and diplomat, journeys to the homeworld of a new species to try to make a crucial alliance for Terra. But the ship is being followed by a faction of the aliens known as the Kator, who wish to destroy the ship, scuttle any deal, and isolate an emerging humanity from its galactic neighbors. And out now is a great collection of military fantasy stories, including work by Elizabeth Moon and Jonathan Mabry. This one is called Operation Arcana is edited by John Joseph Adams. So October mass markets include The Road to Hell by David Weber and Joel Presby, Raising Cain by Charles E. Gannon, and Operation Arcana edited by John Joseph Adams. They're all available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome David Drake back to the podcast. Hello, Dave. Hi, Bain readers. Hi, Tony. David Drake is the mitochondrial Eve of Bane writers, <laughs> or maybe Adam. All right, the 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 Ur the Ur Bane writer was getting, yes, getting old as a yes, tag. Very few people knew what you were talking about, and you know, yes, I can discuss the third dynasty of Ur if you would really like me to, but <laughs> no doubt you can. <laughs> Well, anyway, along with Jim Bain, he defined much of the tenor of what we do here at Bain Books. Dave is the creator of numerous novels and series, including the best-selling Hammer Slammers military science fiction series, and more recently, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy series. He's the author of many other novels and series. Dave is also the author of lots of fantasy stories and fantasy series, including most recently uh, the Book of the Elements series. He's also the co-author on a host of series ranging from the Belisarius novels with Eric Flint to the Citizen series with John Lambshead and the General series with S.M. Sterling, Eric Flint, and me, Tony Daniel. Dave is a graduate of Duke Law School. He's a Vietnam vet where he served in the 11th Cavalry Blackhorn. Let me say that again. Where he served in the 11th Cavalry Blackhorn. Where he served in the 11th Cavalry. <laughs> Black Horse Regiment. He also reads Latin for pleasure. Out now at Booksellers Everywhere is a... I didn't say battalion this time either. You didn't. So I got it. Finally. Well done. Out now at Booksellers Everywhere is a new science... Uh, out now at Booksellers Everywhere is a new young adult edition of a novel Dave wrote some years ago, 20 to be exact, I believe. That book is Patriots by David Drake. Dave Patriots follows a similar David Drake motif, which is to take historical events that are great stories and turn them into science fiction versions. Um, I think I have an idea of where, but where does the history in Patriots spring from? Uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. 
I got that notion. This isn't my end of the country, but uh, I wrote it for Tom Doherty uh, at Tor, and Tom is from Connecticut, so this was very much uh, up in his route. We chatted, and I wound up doing this. So. You wrote it for Tom. Did Tor didn't put this out, though. Did oh, hell yes, they did. Oh, they did. Okay. Uh, so yeah, a... it, it so sank what... like a stone for Tor, yeah. but but absolutely, it was a Tor book. Well, what is, all right, so we, we have a 96 version that's a uh, mass market Bane book. Was that's this a correct. reprint of the Tor book? Uh, that's correct. Tony, uh, the other Tony uh, that we both work for, uh, really liked it and asked to get it and i uh, got it back from tor and um bain has published it in mass market oh yeah i see okay so you wrote it in 96 bain reissued it as a mass market paperback in 2009 there there was a tor hardcover that almost didn't sell and a tor mass market that sold somewhat better mm. uh but I once wrote one of those tour hog covers that almost didn't sell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it happens. Um tour publishes a lot of stuff. Uh, much of it very good. Yeah. So so we're we're bringing it out as a young adult novel. I think Tony just really likes this book uh yes. personally and it is it does make a great young adult novel. There's some hard words in there, but there's uh, not much cussing and, uh, and it's no a, no sex and actually nobody dies. That's true. They're remarkably careful about the children in this one. Well, not like they are. Well, <laughs> some David Drake. Books. Uh, as I say, th this is something that most authors would not have to remark on, but I think it is worth saying that nobody dies in this one. I don't think it's devoid of excitement and there are certainly some bathroom jokes <laughs> per, per, yeah per, i love the way that one of the bad guys gets punished in the end with punishes <laughs> himself yes, yes indeed. um but but it is a ya yes yeah. it, well it's i mean one of the reasons of course is that it's got a, a youthful protagonist in mark maxwell who is, he's not long out of college, and he's on a trip to see the frontier before he maybe settles down to a career. He's he's negotiating with his father about this on his homeworld of Quailhagen. Mark is a pretty solid citizen. He's this, he's a diploma-carrying member of the upper class of, of um, galactic society, human galactic society. Can you tell us more about Mark's character? Uh, he is a young gentleman in the best sense of the word. Uh, his background is the equivalent of um, a youth of good breeding from Boston in 1775. Um, Does he have a historical analog, or was he? No, oh. uh, not, not directly, no. Yeah. Various of the other characters do, of course, but... Um, But um, he he's uh, he is a solid citizen, and he wants to see what the frontier is really like, and he's really kind of shocked when he sees the frontier, but that's what he's there to do. And um, he's naive but not stupid. Uh, no, he, he's he's extremely well educated, and not at all stupid. Uh, he's in over his head, but he doesn't entirely realize how far over his head. Um, my my life in basic training <laughs> provided some of the background for his reaction to the world he suddenly finds himself in, because it's not really that different to be... Uh, drafted out of Duke Law School and dropped into a basic training unit that was um, a third black kids from Detroit, inner city Detroit, a third um, white kids from Western North Carolina who had similar educational backgrounds, 
to the black kids from Detroit, but he had very little else in common. And then the other third of us were college graduates. And um, there was a real culture shock for those of us, even even people like me, who was um, working class, but had been working class with aspirations to the middle class. <laughs> and um, it was a shock. Mm. Did Nobody tried to beat the heck out of you for reading, did they? <laughs> <laughs> or did they? Um, there were problems. There were problems. Yes. <laughs> the uh, that Moliere story you told me earlier, which is not <laughs> directly related to this, but well, I would it, love it, to hear it. It, again. it kind of is. Um, when I was actually in Vietnam with my unit, uh, the times nothing was happening, and there were blocks of time like that. There was a lot of time, and um, a buddy of mine in the interrogation unit I was in uh, was taking a course, or had gotten a correspondence course in French. Well, he wasn't doing, he wasn't using it. So I just borrowed the books from him and taught myself to read French. And uh, because it was Vietnam, uh, I could then look around and find some French books just lying around. For my purposes, one was as good as another. And one of the things I found was uh, the complete plays of Moliere. So I was reading Moliere's plays and walking around with the book, which was a, a standard uh, French paperback, had a typographic cover, which was white, with uh, a yellow border and uh, I was walking around with that in my uh, right cargo pocket of my jungle fatigues and I kept having people stop uh, Drake what you reading there and they pull the book up from the cargo pocket so they could see and then they look at me kind of funny and drop it and I thought well don't they like Moliere <laughs> and then suddenly it struck me that at the time, we're talking 1970, um, one of the porn lines, the, the standard porn lines, was um, nightstand readers, and they had typographic covers. They had a solid yellow cover with, um, you know, just the, the title. So these guys saw the, the yellow border on the paperback I was carrying, and assumed it was Juicy Lucy or something of the sort, and were really kind of shocked that it was French. Uh, so yeah, that that is the sort of thing I mean about a cultural. Yeah, you thing. observed earlier that um, they weren't actually mad that it was that it was Moliere instead of Shakespeare. It was no, no, <laughs> it, they they were not Shakespeare fans who were irritated that I was reading Moliere. Uh, they wanted to borrow the, the porn book, uh, and they saw no point in borrowing the French drama, 17th century drama. Uh, so, well, let's back to Patriots. Um, we start on the planet of Dittersdorf, which is a kind of a way station, and it, it comes in again in the novel later. Um, Mark runs into a couple of real characters there, um, as my grandmother might say. Both are destined to change his life for good and one for ill. Um, but let's talk about that wonderful creation, Yerby Bannock. Well, Yerby Bannock is a very close analog of uh, Ethan Allen, who was a really amazing man. He's much more amazing than... Um, the history books, you know, the potted histories, because he he was a big, powerful man, uh, good-natured, uh, hard-drinking, absolute hellraiser, just absolute hellraiser. He had been kicked out of the Massachusetts colony for brawling, basically, and there was nothing he liked better than a drink or a good fight. 
and you get him the drink, and he'd provide the fight himself. Um, very, a very unlikely hero. Uh, but he wound up as one because somebody pointed him in the right direction at the right time, and there was never any question about his ability to get something done, especially if it involved knocking heads. Um, wonderful, wonderful character, and that is the model for Yerby Manic. Yerby's a big guy, and he... <laughs> In all senses, yep. He can, he can um, physically um, just tear the... He, he crushes weapons with his hands in the book several times. Yeah, well... <laughs> But he is, um, he's, he's also really uh, intuitive and smart, Yerby is. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you, people tend to equate intelligence and education, and that just is not the case. Um, Ethan Allen's brother became the um, basically founder of the University of Vermont. Uh, Ethan was, that was Ira Allen, uh, Ethan was just a different sort of person, but he was as exceptional as his brother Ira, just not as a, uh, an academic. Vermont, I guess Vermont was really kind of a frontier. Oh, it was absolutely a frontier, uh, the more so because... It, it was part of a large tract of crown land which had been granted under uh, previous administrations. However, there were some of the land grants were owned by New Yorkers and some from a different source for the same land were owned by people in Connecticut. And there was, I mean, it was really a case of double selling the same land. So you had a fair number of people who had bought land from the Connecticut developers and settled. And New York started sending the sheriff over sheriffs over to rouse them as trespassers. So the Connecticut investors hired Ethan Allen to uh, get together a, a group of his buddies, drinking buddies, as enforcers to keep the New York bailiffs <laughs> out of Vermont keep, you know, it's safe for Connecticut investors and the people buying from them. So it, it was not only a frontier in the sense that this was uncleared territory. Uh, the civilized portions of the colonies were fighting over ownership. Was there the worry, I mean, in the book, um, your version of Vermont is the planet Greenwood. Mm -hmm. um, and there is the idea that the the semi bad guys, the guys that are first the, at first the bad guys, um, are uh, going to plant big cities and ruin the place. Was there the same sort of notion there? Oh uh, no, they're they were just going to sell it to people buying from them and all of the folks already living on the land, who are you know have spent years clearing the land and building up little farms, were going to be dispossessed. Hmm. Um, no, nobody was really worried about uh, big cities going up. Uh, different culture in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but all the people there were going to be just out and tough. They uh, So we meet Yerby's kid sister um, on uh, Dittersdorf and the, the venal Dr. Jesslyn. What, what can you tell us about these two characters? She's a tough cookie like Yerby, but she's not... She's uh, more refined, I guess. <laughs> uh, she has been to finishing school. Mind you, it's finishing school on the frontier. But um, 
you know, she aspires to being a civilized lady. Um, Dr. Yesseland is basically a con man uh, who claims great education and great knowledge and um, does not have the education, does not really have the knowledge, and is basically venal. And he, he can be bought. He, I mean, I don't know if you were inspired by this, <laughs> but, but you, you remember that old show, Lost in Space? He really reminded me of Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. Uh, yes, that's fair. Yes. <laughs> it was not a conscious influence, but yes. Yeah. So, well, um, so they go to the planet Greenwood, where most of the book takes place. Um, one thing before we get there, um, the star system traversing path. I, I really like that. Um, you made it so real feeling. Um, it's it's like seasickness sort of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You you can get from um, there, but except it makes you psychotic. Oh uh, well, but, yeah. I've been sick enough. Uh, yeah, I uh, I make travel unpleasant, as God knows it is. Uh, but in the the eighteenth century, it was even more unpleasant. Uh, you read the descriptions of by Charles Dickens, for example, of crossing the Atlantic by liner, and uh, think, my God! And people were paying really good money to be able to do this, and the steamships were better than the sailing ships because at least you knew if the fuel held up that you were going to get there. Uh, with a sailing ship, uh, there were no guarantees um, and not much room. And yes, uh, you, you get off and you're miserable and everybody's miserable. And, and you know, some of the, the characters decide to deal with the problem by staying drunk. But, you know, in the case of Yuribi, okay, he'd be Yuribi. doing that anyway. Yes. So. It's just another... Well, the I I really like the description of the crew. The crew has to stay awake and 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 away from the drink, and but they end up um, batshit crazy. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I guess they get better, so they can. Yeah. So they arrive at the planet Greenwood, the the real frontier that Mark that he thought that he was at, but he hasn't been. <laughs> this is the real one. Um, what's Greenwood like? Uh it is a an undeveloped planet. And people are setting up really large estates, and they and a spouse and the kids are trying to put them in shape and uh, turn them into farms. Um, there's no, there's no government. Uh, remember, these aren't people who were really sure they owned their land. Uh, there are no cities. Um, it's, and, you know, folks get along pretty well because folks pretty much do get along. There are no wild Indians in this version. Um, it wasn't really a problem in Vermont either. I mean, they existed, but they weren't a problem. Um, it's, um, it's an undeveloped planet. And Yerby has a big spread. Um, yeah. Because everybody has a big spread. Right? Yeah. That's I mean, the... you know, a lot of land out there. Um, the political situation then is is what you've described, which is that um, there's two big um, cartels two... that have claims to the land. Yes. Uh, two uh, developed colonies both believe they own the land and are selling portions to would-be settlers. And of course, the folks who will settle under those conditions tend to be the folks who are kind of on the edge to begin with, or they would be going for something a little safer. So, you know, you're, you are sorting for folks who are probably pretty close up against it and um, are certainly 
more risk takers than even their neighbors. And, you know, we're not talking about a very settled society anywhere at this point. And I was trying to think, obviously you just provided it. The, the analog for Zenith would be New Yorkers, those evil New Yorkers. With their... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> New York and Boston, <laughs> basically. So um, the first thing, that, the, the first major conflict we have in the book is this between the Greenwood natives and the Zenith from the planet Zenith. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is also where it kind of gets to be a, a fun uh, YA sort of thing. I love the scene where Irby forces the Zenith ship to land in this swamp called the Goo. <laughs> yes. And then he, he marches in. He he basically blackmails them to. Uh, it's a. Can you describe the situation there? It's just a. It's a fun sequence in the book. Uh, yeah, they're they're coming down on instrument landing, and and Mark has set it up. Our hero has set it up so that um, they can take over the the beacon on the planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Burby guides them not to the normal landing spot, but to a large swamp. And they land without anyone being injured. It's soft. Uh, but <laughs> the ship is now sinking into the, uh, the swamp, and the people can get out of the ship, but they actually can't get through the swamp without guides. And so Yerby goes in and, for the price, guides. And, and the price is basically uh, you know, dropping their claims <laughs> and leaving all weapons yeah. and such. Yeah. Um, and he guides them out of the swamp. Also, um, this is the time. This is really, I think, the only time in the book that Mark describes him as tired. Because he's yeah. been yanking all these people out of yeah, I mean. quicksand, basically. <laughs> so um, then there's legal wrangling in the book, too, which I imagine oh, yeah. Um, yeah. some of your law training came in, too. Um, it's about the only time in my fiction that I've actually used the fact that I am a graduate of Duke Law School and practiced law for eight years. And I, I cannot think of another <laughs> case in my fiction that those factors were really important. What is the, all right, this is also where Mark's father shows up, who's a wonderful character as well. Can you tell us about, what, what, all right, what's the legal fight about? And tell us a little bit about Lucius as well, if you would. The, uh, the legal fight is, is quite simple. It's the uh, validity of the land grants between the two granting authorities. And uh, the crucial thing is to get the matter tried by the home world government, and that's our And if, you know, if it's tried locally, uh, if it's tried in Zenith courts, then the Zenith, Zenith land grants are going to be. Yeah. So that it it has to be referred to the the Earth Governor, and uh, then to the Home World, and that is the legal victory. Uh, it doesn't actually provide. It it isn't a complete victory, but it means it's going to be a matter of years before it will actually be tried. And it will be tried fairly when that happens. So, you know, th this is a major factor. And helping them bring, well, this is also where Mark begins to, because um, he can't, he's not really good at fighting. <laughs> so, but he, he has some use here as well as, um, as his dad. Um, so he's been sent out here. He, he, he stands to inherit quite a bit. Yeah, his, um, his father is a very successful lawyer. Yeah, and uh, but if he, 
what was the condition if he does if he comes back after a year and does something useful then he'll get his money otherwise yeah basically uh you you want to travel for a year and, and see the world that's fine and um if you basically if you make a man of yourself then uh, you'll be set up but you know it it is he is given a chance to prove himself and well, throughout the course of the book, the thing that is interesting about Mark's growth or, or character is that, in the end, it doesn't matter, really, if he if he inherits no, the money. No, he, he doesn't care about money anymore. Yeah, and his father is would perfectly well give it to him, I mean, sure. because he, he has become a man. But Mark is beyond that. In the, yep. And that's really what Lucius wanted him to get to anyway. He's a very sympathetic character, the dad in the end, even though he's kind of harsh and <laughs> a little bit undemonstrative. Um, other thing that I saw in Patriots is there's a lot more philosophy than I've encountered in <laughs> most other David Drake books. Um, like you, you have this thought about law. One of the problems with words and laws were words. All right. One of the problems with words and laws were words is that those folks, those folk tended to mistake the image, which I think you mean truth here, and reality. This sounds like the outline of a, a legal philosophy at the least. So law is, is uh, a construct of words. Um, there are other spots in the book where you have Mark reflect on the transience of history. And so are these authorial thoughts or are they just part of picture of Mark you're painting? Well... Um, the picture of Mark is filtered through the mind of the writer, me, and the writer has read Plato, and, um, the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's inevitable that that's going to come out in the work if I'm talking about ideas. I do have ideas. Um, so the... the the problem with words is that we are we're chained to uh, in the cave looking at the shadows yes yes, yes exactly uh. <laughs> the ideal <laughs> but if we are unchained we won't need laws or lawyers exactly <laughs> however <laughs> that's not going to happen any well that, that's <laughs> it it's um i haven't given away my guns i don't guess you have either <laughs> No, I also know how to clear my chamber. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we were talking about uh, that. That, that, that was an earlier yeah. discussion. So, <laughs> um, one of my favorite scenes in the book is when Mark and Yerby visit the armory on Deus, uh, on Dittersdorf, and um, this is—I mean, it was like a scene from Apocalypse Now to me. Um, it it comes or um, Heart of Darkness, except he's coming across these this soldier unit that has just gone nuts um who've not only forgotten their purpose they've they've invented a weird logic to their can you tell us a little bit about what this armory is and um well what's the, happened to these people <laughs> this, this is basically for ticonderoga um which was this critically important military post during the French and Indian Wars, but they were over. And so there's all this ordnance that from the whole area that is just stored in Fort Ticonderoga. And um, there's a group of soldiers there, because it's a fort, uh, and they're basically guarding this stockpile of military equipment. And everybody's forgotten them. I mean, you know, they are completely useless. They're useless to anybody. And everything is breaking down around them. And nobody back at the home world is um, interested in their problems or interested in listening to anything they have to say or anything else. And they have sort of been allowed to quietly live their lives in this huge fort, park, you know, crammed 
with military equipment um, that nobody remembers anymore. And this is, um, did the British, like, send their idiots to Ticonderoga to, in the same? Uh, well, it's or... not precisely that, but you send, you send a unit and then you forget about them. Mm. And trust me, they will get very strange. Mm, odd. Uh, I, I, have, I have seen people in the field very, very strange. And these folks are completely cut off from anything they think of as civilization or anybody would think of as civilization. So yeah. you you make a point in the um in the preface in the introduction to the book um that if the revolutionary forces had not gotten that heavy weaponry from Ticonderoga they wouldn't have had any chance. That was where yes the artillery came from. Yes, that is exactly right. That is why Boston was taken from the British. It was the, and remember that New England was at war long before, I mean, literally at war, shooting war, uh, long before the Declaration of Independence. And that's why the New England delegates were willing to support George Washington as head of the military forces. They deliver, and they had a number of people among their own ranks who thought they would be much better leaders. But New England, as a body, packed George Washington because he was a Virginian. They desperately needed the rest of the country to join in the rebellion against Great Britain because they were already in one. And it really was possible they were going to be allowed to just hang. And without the artillery from Fort Ticonderoga, uh, there would have been no chance of driving the British out of Boston. None. And that was the, um, the beginning of the success of the American Revolution. It was that move. So yeah, this was quite critical. Yeah. And patriots, um, the, and basically the analog is that Dittersdorf has this amazing store of weaponry that that um, that our our heroes found out about earlier, and now come back to acquire um, <laughs> with with the 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 commanding officer who is just trying to plant flower beds, basically. Yeah. And he's he's really Mark a rather sweet these narcissus. Yeah, paper white narcissus. <laughs> I'll give you all the tags, sure. I <laughs> give me some of those seeds. That's a. I just love that scene. Well, he's he's sort of a lovable man. Um, I I will say that um, Ethan Allen, the the official report is that he summons the British commander to surrender in the name of the. Great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. And as for the Continental Congress, it's unlikely that uh, Ethan Allen had ever heard of it. And as for the Great Jehovah, he was known as the most profane man in New England. So, you know, his, his God fearing nature is at least as doubtful as his political. Uh, sophistication, but by God, you want something done. He was the man for it. Much like Gerby Bannock in the book. Yes, or exactly. exactly. Like <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, the book ends with on a hopeful note, uh, but with a cliffhanger of sorts. That I mean, the revolution is underway, yeah. but hasn't is. Did did you write this as a first book in a series? No, no, absolutely just, not. It's just the Ethan Allen story you the, wanted. This, yeah, and actually, if you follow Ethan Allen, the um, story gets harder to to make into a <laughs> a, a heroic story. Uh, he wound up being jailed for trying to uh, sell Vermont to Canada, 
Um, yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah. yeah uh, and yeah. then he started that furniture store. No. <laughs> no, never. No. Uh, but he, he was a hellraiser. Uh, he was in no sense a soldier. Um, his courage, yes. And he was the sort of man who was, as a countryman, as a, a country-bred friend of mine, he'd fight a circle saw. Uh, and, <laughs> anyway, he'd probably be drunk. But um, he, he was capable of behaving, behaving heroically. But he wasn't a hero, in in the sense you, in the sense you get out of a book, he. You get the impression from a book, that. He, was a patriot, who captured Fort Ticonderoga. To spark off a successful revolution, he did absolutely nothing of the case. And nobody's really quite sure why he decided it was a good idea to capture Fort Ticonderoga. But it was there, so he did it. Um, and if the book has a moral, I think it's this, that you are making history, whoever you are, whatever you're doing. And you might think about that occasionally, because looking back from 50 years on, things may look very different. And be sure you keep that in mind, that there are side effects to anything, and everything you do has side effects. So. That is actually a great place to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do that then, The book Tony. is Patriots by David Drake, now out in young adult format and to be found in the print edition in the young adult section of your favorite bookseller. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for being with us again and in the studio. Yes, and my pleasure to be here. And um... Oh, by the way, the reason Dave is here is that he won <laughs> the um, the best short story in our year's best uh, military the uh, science fiction and adventure fiction uh, anthology that David F. Sherrad, who podcast listeners know as one of our hosts, uh, puts together every year, and uh, that was neat. I mean, it that that was a neat thing. I have a plaque, and um, is also not insignificant that I have five. And Tony, other Tony, uh, they are crisp still. <laughs> Uh, I have $500 bills, courtesy of Bain Books, uh, a, an award when Tony Weisskopf is doing it is not just a plaque to put on your wall and brag about. It is something real. And, you know, you can't really say that about a nebula. <laughs> not, not that I'm ever going to be winning a nebula, but, but I've seen people who have. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of them would would be very happy if the five hundred bucks were given in. Re I <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we probably shouldn't go there. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's "The Sea Without a Shore." It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the Rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad, even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Coursera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 12 Brotherhood on Coursera. 
When Cleveland reached the top of the ladder, Adele gave him the jute rag on which she and Tovera had already wiped their hands. The harbor level had dropped several feet in the recent past, and the bottom four rungs were slimy with a mixture of lubricant, algae, and the organic waste which nourished the algae. Ah, thank you, your ladyship, Cleveland said. He turned his head, obviously looking for a place to deposit the rag. Adele took it between her right thumb and forefinger. I prefer to be called Mundy, Cleveland, she said. In Xenos, and certainly here. She dropped the rag into the slip. Returning like to like, she explained with a cold smile. I can no more clean up this harbor than I could remove all negative and discourteous people from the human race. I, Cleveland said. He suddenly smiled. I understand, Mundy. I'm trying to do the latter, starting with myself. But until I have become perfect, I won't bother the rest of humanity. He cocked his head slightly. From what I've seen, he said, you have less need of correction than anyone I've previously met. It depends on what you mean by negative, Tovera said. Her grin reminded Adele of a skull's. Perhaps skulls also had a sense of humor. Rather than go up Central Street, Cleveland said, gesturing to the sloping boulevard leading straight up toward the manor. I suggest we go through the town. It may be a little longer, but this end of the plaza is an obstacle course that I'd prefer to avoid. Adele shrugged. You know the town, she said. Cleveland led them briskly across Water Street, or whatever it was called here. Adele reached for her data unit, then caught herself with a grim smile. Cleveland, she said. If Tovera can learn to mimic a sense of humor, I can give the impression of being a socialized human being. What is the name of the street that circles the harbor? I'm just curious. That's just Harborside, you're... That is, Monday, he said. He gestured ahead of them, moving his left arm from side to side. Now we're on Sweeney's Alley at this end, but it'll be Crescent Alley at the top when we reach Ridge Road. The passage they'd turned up seemed to meander between the structures rather than them being built to either side. It was generally about ten feet wide, though occasionally the corner of a building narrowed by it. Are all the streets here this way? Adele asked. The alley had no sharp angles, but she couldn't see more than thirty feet ahead or behind because of twists in the course. This is the widest street after Central, Cleveland said, generally at least. People built where the slope allowed them to. Every ten years or so, the harbor district gets flooded, from what I've been told. Adele followed him under a balcony enclosed in carved wood screens. The lower half of the screen on the downhill side had cracked away and was replaced by a sheet of plastic. Tovera waited two steps back until they were clear. Her right hand was fully inside the case which held her submachine gun. Cleveland didn't appear to notice. Adele suppressed a frown. She could not object to Tovera's extreme professional care, and in theory it shouldn't have affected Adele. Tovera wasn't directing her to scan rooftops or to be ready if a gunman leaned over the gate across the way. Irrationally, it did induce paranoia in Adele, though her intellectual control prevented that from being visible to anyone outside her mind. The gate Adele had been considering darkened as a middle-aged woman stepped to it. The vertical stripes of her loose dress did little to reduce her bulk. She held a trowel in her right hand. Madam, Cleveland said, smiling as he passed. To Adele's surprise, the woman's stony expression dissolved into a smile which took ten years off her apparent age. Adele nodded to the woman but didn't attempt to smile. She had found in the past that her smiles rarely struck strangers as friendly, which was fair, as Adele rarely felt friendly toward strangers. The flower beds she glimpsed past the gardener were gorgeously colorful. They looked unplanned, but Adele understood patterns well enough to realize that what she saw was as carefully structured as one of her own databases. Brotherhood appears to be, Adele said, then paused to word the rest of the statement correctly. A more ordinary community than I was expecting in the midst of war. Cleveland turned his head and smiled. Some members of my faith believe that the presence of our fellowship, only fifty miles south in Pearl Valley, Helps make brotherhood such a pleasant community, he said. 
despite the port and the miners, which are the basis of the economy. I prefer to think that people are generally decent when given an opportunity to be. Adele felt a wry smile tug at the corners of her lips. Whereas I myself consider it a good day when I don't feel a desire to shoot one of the people with whom I have to deal. She supposed that both reactions were within the acceptable norms of civilized society. This is Ridge Road, Cleveland said as they rounded a curving house wall. We'll turn to the right here. On the ten-foot-wide street was the first motorized traffic Adele had seen since they started up the hillside. Two men were guiding a cart with hub center motors from left to right. On the bed rode what looked like a refrigeration unit. Coming the other way was a chain-driven vehicle on four high, flimsy-looking wheels. It looked like something built locally from spare parts. On the front axle was a triangular metal pennon stenciled with a light blue trefoil. The woman driving from a saddle was beautiful and well-dressed. She was alone on the vehicle, but it ambled at the pace of the squad of soldiers on foot escorting her. The troop's battle dress was striped black on dark green. They carried stocked impellers comparable to the carbines in the Kaisha's hold. Ah, that's Calera driving the buggy, Cleveland said. She was working as an entertainer. She may be local, but I wouldn't know. She's now the companion of Mistress Tibbs, the chief administrator of the self-defense regiment. Their headquarters is on the other side of the square, so I guess that's where she's going. And the Navy headquarters is in the building alongside theirs, but they've both got their barracks by the harbor. I see, said Adele, noting the information mentally. She would transfer it to digital form as soon as she got an opportunity. The troops were well turned out, and they hadn't given her the impression of being bravos looking for a fight the way many uniformed gangs did here on the fringes. And Brother Graves? Across the street and two doors up, Cleveland said and started across. Another vehicle of some sort was visible to the right, but it seemed to be parked. Men were carrying pipes from it. The only moving traffic was pedestrian. Adele could see the plaza to the left. The paving blocks nearer the slope rippled like the sea, just as Cleveland had warned. The building which faced the plaza was a palace built of either stone or stone-clad concrete. Farther from the plaza were two-story shops and offices, some with apartments above on both sides of the street. Between a clothier's shop and a tavern, not a dive, was a door painted a pearl white. Cleveland swung it open to a flight of steps upward. The panel moved with a weight of steel, but it hadn't been locked. Tovera touched the edge of the door. I'll close it, she said courteously to Cleveland, so that you can lead. Right, said Cleveland, skipping up the stairs two at a time. The door thumped shut. If he realized that Tovera didn't trust him behind them, his pleasant smile gave no sign of it. Adele followed. She found these wooden treads relaxing. She was more used to metal stairs. Adele heard minute hesitations in Tovera's steps as the servant glanced over her shoulder. She wondered if Tovera's need for constant vigilance made her unhappy. Perhaps she no more regarded it than she did breathing. Cleveland opened the door at the head of the stairs. Brother Graves, he called. I'm here with, uh, Mistress Mundy. Captain Leary is dealing with the port authorities, but Mundy is a partner in the expedition. Please come in, Mistress said a small, middle-aged man wearing a tan business suit with a thin brown stripe. He was balding from forehead to mid-scalp, but his voice was lively and the hand with which he shook Adele's was firm. I'm Graves, and don't worry about brother, since you have no reason to regard me or Cleveland as your brothers. We appreciate your help all the more for that reason. The office was a single room, though there was a door in the back wall which probably led to living quarters. There were couches along two walls, and a pair of chairs flanked the entrance. The other item of furnishing was a commercial console which Adele realized was as powerful as a starship unit. She smiled at the thought. It's probably configured differently. I don't know how much help we can be, she said aloud, suppressing the reflex to explain that she wasn't Daniel's partner. In fact, she was his partner, in every respect except the legal ones, which didn't matter to either Daniel or herself. It seems to me that digging up the treasure is more a matter for a mining engineer than how to describe the Kaisha's crew. Generalists like ourselves. Mining engineers are twenty a dandy prat on Coursera, 
Graves said. He gestured to the couch, then seated himself on one end of it. I'm one myself, as a matter of fact. The political situation on Coursera, however, his wry smile seemed warm, but there was sadness behind it, is such that bringing mining equipment openly to Pearl Valley would arouse suspicion, and most certainly violence by one of the competing parties, if any inkling of the purpose got out. Adele made another mental note, this time to check the meaning of dandy prat. From context, it could be anything from a coin to a vegetable, but that wasn't the matter at hand. The cargo we brought is weapons, Adele said, sitting on the other end of the couch. Cleveland took a chair while Tovera continued to stand near the hinge side of the door. We thought we would blend in that way and explain our presence in an acceptable fashion. When we've examined the situation, we'll acquire such machinery as we need here. Graves grimaced. Yes, he said. Yes, you're right, of course. But that brings its own problems. I cringed when I saw the manifest you transmitted from orbit, because I'm sure it will cause others, the garrison at least, to attempt to get the arms for themselves. Do you mean to hijack our cargo? Adele said, trying to keep her tone neutral. Tovera smiled slightly. Oh, they wouldn't do anything that raw, Cleveland said, looking from Adele to Graves. Why, neither the regiment nor the navy would allow that to happen, even if Murciello were willing. Graves spread his hands, palms up, and looked down at them. I'm an engineer, Brother Cleveland, he said. I think such an action would show very bad judgment on Colonel Murciello's part, but... He raised his eyes. His expression was the same sad smile as before. I don't have a high opinion of the Colonel's judgment, even now. Still, what I'm expecting is pressure to sell the cargo to another of the parties instead of delivering it to the consignees. Graves clenched his fists again. I ought to be at the port office, too, he said. But I told myself I wouldn't be much support in that sort of unpleasant hectoring. I still should have gone. He looked up. Adele shrugged. I don't think Captain Leary will be unduly swayed by someone shouting at him, she said. How will you get the cargo to Pearl Valley? Doing that will reduce the risk of trouble, I presume. Yes, of course, Graves said. He rose and went to the console. That much I can take care of. There's a barge under contract to us. I'm alerting the crew so that they'll be ready to perform at any schedule that you, that Captain Leary sets. He used a virtual keyboard to make entries. The holographic display was unreadable from this side, but Adele's personal data unit was absorbing that input and all others within the office. Graves looked toward Adele through the holographic blurry. He said, I'm not a very good representative under these conditions, I'm afraid. I'll only say in my defense that none of our community has the right personality for cutthroat, beggar-your-neighbor dealings, such as have become the only way business is transacted in brotherhood. Some of us did have that personality. I did myself, I'm sorry to admit. He gave Adele a smile of warm fellowship. But that was before I felt the kinship in Pearl Valley and became a transformationist myself. There doesn't seem to be any way to go back, thank goodness. Though sometimes I feel that the old me would be useful to the faith. Will the weapons be of any use to you? Adele said. She was mostly successful in hiding her frown. We'll fight to save ourselves and our faith, Cleveland said. Brother Graves shouldn't denigrate himself. He's been a very effective advocate for our community in the Independence Council. I know, having just come back from a separation of many light years. Cleveland forced a smile. His expression was that of someone just released from torture, trying to put a brave face on what he had undergone what it means for him to remain here and deal with people who are boiling with hatred and hostility every hour of every day. Adele said, Given the problems within your coalition, it stretched a point to call the Independence Council a coalition, but this wasn't a time to debate word choice. I'm surprised that the rebellion has been as successful as it has. The current status of the war had the Pantelarians besieged on the Delta, whose agricultural output was of no importance to Pantelaria or concern to the rebels in the south. Adele presumed that the miners were paying more for food, which now had to be smuggled from the Delta, not difficult from what Daniel had said about the situation around Hablinger, or brought in from a greater distance. People in Brotherhood weren't going hungry, however. It wasn't always like this, Cleveland said, shaking his head. It wasn't like this even when I took ship for Cinnabar. And at the beginning, well, he circled his right hand. 
It was a war, which is... He waggled his hand again, looking for a word. Antisocial, Graves said, smiling. He returned to the couch from which he'd risen to alert the barge crew. Right. Antisocial by definition, Cleveland said. He smiled too, but his eyes were focused on the base of the console. But within the independence movement, the rebels, if you wish, there was great enthusiasm and, well, brotherhood. Like nothing I'd seen anywhere beyond the transformationist community. The sort of spirit that gets nations into wars, Adele said, rarely lasts long. Usually it doesn't last beyond the first set of casualty returns. I'm sorry if that sounds cynical. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Chukowitz and a Latinate contract clause that ensures falling asteroid mitigation coverage, but doesn't really do anything about falling asteroids, plus motorcycle revs of thanks and gratitude for David Drake, author of the new young adult edition, Patriots. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 